You're listening to Talking Hoosier Baseball, a podcast by fans from the iubase.com website for anyone wanting more information on the Indiana University baseball program. on Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. I'm Josh Bennett, joined by stats guru Cassidy Palmer, master of the RPI Carl James, and the man who appreciates a good bat flip, Chris Feeney. I'll get us started with a recap of last weekend's series at home versus the Iowa Hawkeyes. The weekend got off to a less than seller start on Friday evening with the Hoosiers falling in a one-run game by the score of 6-5 to five, with three IU errors leading to half the scoring for the Hawkeyes. Tommy Summer got the start and went four innings, allowing five hits and two earned runs. Braden Tucker allowed one earned run in his two innings. Braden Scott pitched two scoreless, and Reese Sharp finished the game with a perfect ninth. Yeah, the bullpen's been terrific. It's, it's been a strength for us all year. It's allowed us to, to get starters out when we feel like they're, they're at, the end of their, at the end of their outing and not have to extend or push them. And, you know, it seems like each week we've kind of added a new, a new arm. Braden Scott was really good uh, today. It's good to have him, you know, really back in the fold. Uh, Reese Sharp was outstanding, really, really overpowering stuff. And uh, Offensively, the Hoosiers were led by Cole Barr, who went two for three with a triple, two runs and a walk. Kip Fugers went two for four with a double. Uh, the Hoosiers looked to bounce back on Saturday and make it a series, and it didn't take long for him to get out to a lead, scoring five runs in the bottom of the first. Uh, there was a little bit of controversy in that inning as the Iowa right fielder made a diving attempt on a drive into the gap. Uh, to many there, it appeared as though he made the catch and doubled up Drew Ashley at second base. Uh, but it didn't matter what the spectators thought. The umpire ruled that he trapped the ball. And IU proceeded to take advantage by scoring five runs and chasing Iowa starter Drew Irvin before he could record a single out. We are getting a lot better offensively, and it's beginning to show. Um, and, and I think that the big part of that, too, is understanding as a group collectively that offense is more than just hitting. Like, it's more than just my swing. It's more than just how my swing looks. There's so much more to it, the base running, the two-strike approaches, all the things that, that, that aren't sexy, that aren't fun, that, that don't show up. There's no Twitter highlights of a good secondary, you know, uh, floating around the Internet right now. There's no uh, t- Twitter highlights of a, of a two-strike ground ball in the middle of the field with the guy on third base and one out. And that's just not um, what's really, uh, you know, uh, popularized in our, in, in our game. So for uh, the Hawkeyes scored three in the next half inning to pull closer, but the Hoosiers answered back immediately with the three spot of their own. The bats were alive all game for the cream and crimson who tallied 14 hits on the day, six of those being extra bases. Offensively, Paul Tates was three for five with two runs. Grant Richardson was two for five, scoring two runs and driving in a pair. Cole Barr was two for three, scoring two runs with a home run, sack fly, walk, and two runs batted in. Uh, we, just, we just had to play some better baseball. I mean, we had a few mistakes yesterday that came back by us in the butt. But, I mean, you know, I think we we played just well offensively, too. I mean, yesterday they had a really good starter. I think we did what we could against them. And today we just kept leaning on them, and we broke out. And Tyler Van Pelt had two hits, a walk, hit by pitch, and two runs in, driven in on the day. Every at bat, I try to take every single pitch to what it is, and I compete. And then whatever happens from there is what happens. So. On the pitching side, McCain Brown allowed five earned runs in two and two thirds, and John Madunio collected his second one of the season by giving up just one earned run in his two and a third on the bump. Ty Bothwell got the save in the 12-6 Hoosier victory by pitching four innings without giving up a run. So looking to earn a big series win and perhaps take hold of first place in the Big Ten standings on Sunday, IU turned to Gabe Beerman, who's been lights out over his last three starts. It was locked up at two apiece going into the bottom of the fourth when the Hoosiers broke it open with five two-out runs. Tates, who got it started with a two-run single, was driven in on a Grant Richardson triple. Uh, Cole Barr then followed with a two-run bomb. Uh, more on that later in the show. But uh, Iowa did manage to get back, get it back to as close as eight to five before Ethan Vacrumba put it away in the eighth with his first career home run, three-run shot. Gabe Bierman got the win for the 
12 8 final with three earned runs and nine strikeouts in six innings. I've been, you know, throwing my off speed for strikes lately and uh, I've been working on it a lot and like bullpens and stuff. So um, that stuff doesn't really scare me. I mean, I still have good enough stuff to get them to swing and miss. So, um, like I said, I'm not really worried about that. I just got to keep working on throwing strikes. As the 12 runs indicated, the bats stayed hot from the day before and the Hoosiers collected 16 hits for the game. Tate's had his second three hit game in a row, tallying two doubles, two RBI, and three runs scored. Hopkins had a career day in front of his family and continued on his doubles tear, collecting three more and going four for four on the day. I've really just gotten comfortable. Um, that's that's really the, the main influence there. But just staying simple, um, like I said, um, my swing is in a really good spot thanks to, to Merce and the coaching staff trying to get me there. So I'm just really trying to stay simple and short and quick to the ball. So seeing it well, and it's just about how it's going, how it's going right now. Cole Barr had multi-hit games in all three in the series, going two for four with another home run, scored two runs, and drove in three. Barr's weekend batting 600 with a triple, two home runs, and five RBI, not to mention two really good defensive plays, uh, one on a chopper where he stepped on the bag and then threw to first, uh, falling into foul territory to complete a double play, and then the other being on a do-or-die barehanded play that he came in on really well. Um, all that combined package on the weekend led him to be named Big Ten Player of the Week. Uh, also of note on Sunday's rubber, mat, uh, Sunday's rubber match was preceded by a ceremony honoring this year's seniors. Those who participated were Drew Ashley, Cole Barr, Jordan Fusey, Colin Hopkins, Jeremy Houston, Grant Machaki, Connor Manis, Tommy Summer, Braden Scott, Tyler Van Pelt, Matt Litwicky, and Jacob Southern. Also honored were managers Mitch Robinson and Noah Gastineau, and assistant to the director of baseball operations, Hannah Chait. So IUBase.com would like to give a shout out to those individuals and thank them for all the hard work, effort, and sacrifices they made uh, to make Hoosier Nation proud. It's been fun to watch you all compete. So that will do it for this week's recap. So I'll get us going on our Hoosier highlight segment. I kind of hinted at this in the recap, but my Hoosier highlight this week will come from the big moment in that five-run fifth inning on the clincher on Sunday. Grant had just hit his triple to drive in the third run. Uh, the dugout was really into it, and to be honest, we were talking about it. For the first time all season, the fans were making a noticeable home field advantage with some noise. Uh, anyway, Richardson was really being a pest and getting into the Iowa pitcher's head by bluffing down the line as, as the pitcher started his delivery, delivery, and I honestly thought after the second or third time he might actually try to steal. Uh, you could really tell it was getting to him between the step-offs and all the time he was taking between pitches. Uh, I can't remember how many times that they went through that back and forth, and then boom, pitcher serves, serves up a meatball to Cole, who absolutely destroyed it. Uh, the place went nuts. Colin bounces out of the dugout to lead in the celebration and looks at Grant and points to him and then puts three fingers to his head, you know, basically giving kudos to Grant for being such a distraction. Um, now the pitcher could have served it up anyway. No one knows, but it reminded me of when Johnny Cueto was pitching for the Reds in the playoff game in Pittsburgh. Uh, the fans were all over, over him chanting his name and he dropped the ball on, on the mound going into his wind, wind up. Uh, you knew he was rattled at that point. You knew, you knew they had him next pitch home run. Uh, so anyway, it was a cool moment to witness and, and come to find out post game grant did have a green light to run. I probably would have enjoyed a steal at home even more than that bomb, but I'll take either one. Uh, so Cass, what was your, who's your highlight this week? Thanks, Josh. Uh, for me, uh, there, there are a lot of ways I could go with this, but I'm going to go with the first inning of offense in game two. After such a tough Friday loss, claw your way back into it and just can't quite make it. To bat around in the first, or essentially bat around and have all nine guys come up in the uh, first inning of game one, put up five runs, like it, it really doesn't get much better than that. And I mean, it was double, double, single, walk, single, HBP. Like it, there was one unproductive plate appearance in that first inning. And it was the third out because the third out is pretty well always, not always, but if the third out is the batter, it is always going to be unproductive. Um, 
so to me that that rebound on the first inning after game one was huge and and honestly offensively set the tone for the rest of the weekend uh carl how about you what was your who's your highlight uh, for me i'm going to choose uh Grant Richardson's swinging bunt in the third game. Yes. And, and, I, and I stress this because if you look at Grant and his development over the years, uh, and even Coach talked about it, you know, he's had a particular weak spot, which is if he gets into a two-strike position against a quality left-handed pitcher, he has struggled. And in this case, he had a 2-2 count. Um, and he just kept focused. He kept battling and it's just one of those things. It's the distinction between putting the bat on the ball and striking out. He did not strike out. He put the bat on the ball. It didn't go very far. In fact, it didn't go so far as it was a hit. And then not only was it a hit, but the pitcher threw it away. So he ended up on second base and the run ended up scoring. Good things happen when contact is made. And in a particularly bad matchup for Grant, he made that work. Um, and then, of course, he followed that up with an actual bunt and then the and then, you know, and then actually uh, got on base. So with all of those things happening, um, you know, Grant is showing why he has been such a consistent hitter this year and how he is developing his skill set. Um, it was really fantastic to see. Uh, Chris, uh, what are your highlights? Uh, from future and pro Hoosiers. Thanks, Carl. We had a, a couple of big highlights from the future Hoosiers. Um, Josh Pine of, of a Linton High School. He had been out for a while with an injury, but he came back in a pretty big way in the start the, this week. He hit two home runs and three RBIs and then picked up the win on the mound. So it was good to see Josh back out there. I know he's a big piece of the class of 2021 that we hear a lot about. But he hadn't heard his name a lot lately. And, and I'm, you know, looking into it, it kind of had the vibe that he might have been hurt or whatever. But I'd say he came back pretty well uh, this past week. And it's good to see that from Josh. We've seen him for years. You know, there were showcases at the bar to being able to see him play Bloomington South. You know, it, it's good to see him. He's a, a solid infielder shortstop. And he's obviously been playing some uh, good ball on the mound. He's got the power bat. So Josh should be uh, fiddling right at home. We're Kip Fugers on the team when he shows up. So it'll be easy to set up that way. Another future Hoosier. This, if you haven't seen this video, you need to check it out. Colson Montgomery hit a bomb out of Boss Field. When I say out of the field, it meant out of the field. Like left the stadium shot. Um, against, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Mater D maybe? Uh, for Southridge High School. This thing is a monster shot. The sweet left-handed swing. It's just, you can see the talent just oozing off this kid. I really hope he finds his way to the bar. I understand it might not happen. Um, and I was looking into it. He's really been getting the uh, circa 99, 2000 Barry Bonds treatment this year. Where, you know, intentional walks, three intentional walks a game, two intentional walks a game. Um, in this game, he had one four and home run, three walks. But he was able to steal a bag, drive in a run, and score three runs. So even though they're trying to keep him out of the offensive production of the game with all the walks, he's finding ways to contribute. And we already know he's a big leader from his basketball team. And Colson would be quite the piece to be showing up here if it should happen. We understand it might not. But a big bomb for Colson, Montgomery. And to go over to the pro, uh, you know, Hugh Hoosier alums, at Pro Bowl Hoosiers, let me tell you what this guy's been doing. He had the NFL draft, which he just did an outstanding job with the football stuff for the Hoosiers. And then he has minor league opening day all wrapped into like one weekend. And I gotta say he killed it. And he sent me over the leagues that the guys are in. So I just wanted to go over those. It's some names we haven't heard in a while, right? Cause we didn't have minor league last year. And now it's really just kicking in this year. So we have Cade Bunnell in single a, which is the low a league, which they've mixed. Elijah Dunham is also single a in the high a league, another mixed league, but one they are calling high a we have Tanner Gordon, Timmy Heron and Paulie Minto, uh, Paulie Milto. And Cass pointed out before we started, it sounds like Milto is going against Gordon tonight. I don't have an update at the time. I wish I did. But it's Hoosier versus Hoosier in the high A. Uh, double A, we have Greg Didolo, Scotty F. Frost, and Luke Miller. And Luke Miller hit a bomb yesterday. And I was quick to point out it was May the 4th when he did it. And I thought that was pretty great by Luke. Triple uh, A. You know, we already knew Kyle uh, Hart and Jonathan Stever were on that alternate team 
So now they're officially AAA. And then uh, Sam Travis has made the AAA team for the Seattle Mariners, which is good to see. So it's a loaded minor league team. And I know there were some names we haven't heard that you might have expected. We don't know those names and where they might be located or we haven't seen anything official. So obviously if something comes up when we hear something, we'll obviously put that information out there. But I know I missed it. I might be a little, you know, I like, I mean, we all really love baseball. The box scores and seeing how guys did. I missed the minor league season last year. I got to really say that. Following our guys through the leagues, we only you know, have a handful in the majors. And this really opens it up, and you can see how they do through the minors. At Pro Bowl Hoosiers on Twitter, if you're not following it, you're not doing Twitter right. <laughs> so uh, figure that out. And again, all sports. He follows them all. Uh, overseas, it doesn't matter. You know, I know some of the sports, the, the guys hook up in England and Europe and Africa. He's got it all. And he's, he can find the map. He puts the map on there. It's amazing what he does. But a uh, big thank you to him. And as much as he works on stats, I know Cass does too. And she's going to have some stats update for us now. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so, so my stats tonight are going to be particularly focused. And I, I want to revisit something that that I had talked about a few weeks ago and then the clip will go here um, yeah so so uh, I, I want to eat a little bit of crow here I said I said that Colin Hopkins wasn't going to be a, a Cole Barr or a Grant Richardson well the last two weeks he has been there there is literally not a player on this team who has hit better these last two weeks uh, it, against Minnesota and Iowa, Colin hit a ridiculous 571. That is nuts. No, the, the closest person to him for guys with, with a decent number of, of plate appearances is Paul Tate's at 407. Like that, that's such a big difference, 571 to, to 407. Uh, you've got Barr at 391 and and you've got Richardson at 400. Like that, the tear that Hopkins has been on is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, looking at where he was to where he is now, that, that batting average for him on the season has jumped up so high in, in just this short amount of time. And I, I wanted to take a look uh, comparing before the Minnesota series to the Minnesota and, and Iowa series combined. Now, before the, uh, before the last couple of weeks, Colin was batting 070, which yeah, you, you take it for the, the defense that he gives you at catcher, but not necessarily the most happily to do so. Um, the, the bonus for him in, in that stretch of time is he was striking out in under 20% of plate appearances. That was kind of really the, the biggest help for him. He, he was consistently putting bat on ball. The last two weeks, like I mentioned, 571, he's walking in 15% of his plate appearances, which is, he, he had zero walks before these last couple of weeks. Um, he, his strikeout rate has cut in half from that time. It's gone from 19% to 9.5%. He, he has struck out just two times over the last two weeks. Uh, he his, he's hitting the same 571 with two outs, which is fantastic. He hasn't struck out with a runner on third and fewer than two outs. He he is hitting the absolute cover off of the ball, and and it's not I, as much as I love the little little bloop hits and the little the little. Oh, well, it's a line drive in the, the scorebook. I, I love those. He's not hitting those. He is crushing the ball. He, he is hitting double after double after double. 
so so I think it's safe to say that water is starting to find its level. I would not expect Colin to continue hitting in that 571 zone, but in the in the 220s to 250s, uh, kind of where he is now, I would not be surprised to see him consistently stick around in that level. Um, last week, I could kind of shake it shake off his his great bat with it was Minnesota. But he actually hit better against Iowa than he did Minnesota. Like that is, and and the team as a whole hit phenomenally against Iowa. A three sixty one average against a staff like Iowa's. I'm absolutely thrilled with that. And so to to see everyone hit well is great. But to but to see Colin hit well has been especially fun the last couple of weeks and it really does open up this offense if you've got that guy in the the bottom third of the order who is consistently hitting and hitting well and fighting through at bats this offense just opens up so much you can't you can't let off the gas as a as an opposing pitcher um and and so that's just been very very fun to watch and and I'm hoping it continues uh, continues to be a fun time there because that is th- this is just kind of a special st- at this point in the season, especially with the the uh, difficulty with opponents getting higher. To see a guy go on a run like this is rare enough, but to see someone who was batting 070 go on a run like this is particularly special. Uh, So Carl, uh, Indiana's cracked most of the national rankings. Uh, Where do they stand in your Big Ten power ranks this week? All right, Cassidy. Yes, they have cracked uh, the rankings. Uh, D1 baseball has Indiana at number 24. Um, They go as high as uh, 17 in perfect games. Um, and as low as unranked by 11.7. So yeah, 11.7. Yeah. We, we like their podcast, but you know, uh, come on guys. Nebraska still ranked really come on. Okay. In my power rankings, <laughs> it's interesting. I compare week eight to week nine. So uh, in my last week rankings, when I look at the comparison, basically you had three sets of teams flip. So Nebraska was number one, Indiana was number three. Those two teams flip. Iowa, perfectly steady at number two. Um, um, In week eight, you had Michigan at four, Maryland at five. They flipped. You had Ohio State at six, Rutgers at seven. They flipped. So a whole lot of flipping going on. Um, But in the end, Indiana's number one. And where is that? You know, I basically have three elements here. Uh, Warren Nolan's ELO rankings, which Indiana was number two last week. Indiana jumps to number one. Indiana jumps to number one in the Big Ten standings. Um, Stays pat at number seven, still in the middle in RPI. Um, The strength of the the last four weeks will solve all that. Um, You know, I don't know how much the Northwestern not playing uh, two weeks of baseball, at least, is going to impact that. We might now finally start to see a little bit of difference in RPI compared to standings at the end, depending on what happens with Northwestern. Um, but they are not playing Purdue this weekend. That shouldn't have a massive impact. But if Northwestern, uh, what happens with Northwest with Northwestern the next week when they play supposedly play Nebraska, that will have a bit of an impact. Um, so those three components together. What really stands out here, though, is when I put those together and I just use a golf score. So I just add those up and then divide them. So essentially you get, you know, where are they ranked? Last week you had Nebraska 1.3. So pretty close to number one. Iowa second in the rankings, but their total golf score was three. So you had three, then 3.7, then 3.7, then 4.7. So the next four were all really close. So Nebraska really had set themselves ahead. And that was kind of why several organizations were thinking Nebraska might be in line for a host. Nebraska gets swept at home by Rutgers. And now you have Indiana 3.0, Iowa 3.0, 
Nebraska all the way down to 3.7, Maryland 3.7, Michigan 4.0. So the top five have a rank difference of one when you combine the golf scores. That is how tight the Big Ten really is right now. Chris, it's time to hand out some hardware. Thanks, Carl. And you mentioned how close the uh, the Big Ten is. You know, the golf score combined one. I don't know about all that, but I know that defensive red belt for this week was one of the hardest ones since the beginning of any show we've ever done, okay? And if you would have told me that after Friday night, I would have told you you were nuts, all right? It was sloppy and, and the poor execution of defense that we had Friday. If you would have told me what was coming it was Saturday and Sunday, again, Two for Ashley, two for Ball, two for Tates. Now, Tates' was Friday. I didn't see it. You know, I wasn't able to go to the game. But, uh, you know, you're getting another one from Tates. Tates turning double plays all over the place. Cold Ball barehanded things. They really showed out because there wasn't uh, consistency on the weekend for defense. It was up and down, right? It was up and down even through Saturday, even through Sunday. Okay, there was some errors. But the way that team was able to execute late, on Sunday, on that one inning, really showed me something. And Tate's play was in that inning, and that's how he's winning the defensive red belt. Okay, he's got that late play. Where did it go off the guy's foot? I don't think I even realized that the game went off the pitcher's foot, the one he came in on. Then he got the one where he gets uh, deep in the hole, right past the bag, and, and makes the play. So Paul Tate's is going to win this week's Tony Butler Award for defense. And really, just to talk about him, an excuse to talk about him in the field, how surprising he's been. I remember in the preseason having to ask coach. Now, this is a middle infielder, right? It's not strictly third base. And he's like, no, no, middle infield. He can go second short because we hadn't really known if he could because he was basically a third baseman in high school. So we really didn't know. And he has really shined at second base. I know a couple of times I talked to Josh uh, at the game on Sunday, how impressive his footwork turned to and knowing he was primarily a guy on the left side and that this is all new for him. You know, I saw Daniel Murphy try to do it. I was like breaking his foot. He was falling down. Like to watch Murphy, like he couldn't do it. It's something about that reverse spin on the double play. And we've seen lots of DPs from Tank to Tates to Fuj uh, to Fujers that have really been, and, and they're bang, bang. They're bang, bang plays. Any execution goes off, the guy's going to be safe. So really impressive weekend uh, when we needed it in that inning. So Paul Tates gets his defensive, the offensive red belt. There was a lot more offense this weekend than I thought there was going to be. I thought these games were going to be much closer. I tried to do the quick math when Cass or, or Josh was doing it. Is it right that we had 30 hits Saturday and Sunday combined? I think that's what I saw. I never would have guessed uh, 30 hits in two combined games over the weekend. But lots of good offense, lots of good choices. I am going to end up agreeing with the Big Ten this week. But I swear, I write these down before I know. Cole Barr. Is your, is your offensive Alex Dickerson award. And a lot of that, too, was the moments when he did it. I mean, he was just strangleholding these dudes, right? Big hit after big hit, lightning bolt shots right when we needed it. Uh, Coach mentioned it. I don't think it was this pressure, but maybe the one right after Sunday's game where it felt like a boxing fight. We're like, we had to take their punch. And then, you know, we had to take – and then we would give our punch. And I feel like Barr did a lot of the punching. So Cole gets the offensive uh, red belt, the Alex Dickerson. And that leaves me for the Joey Donato red belt. I don't know. Maybe this one's a little bit of a dark horse, but I was really, really impressed by Ty Bothwell. All right. If you looked at the innings, if you looked at all the scoring that went on all weekend, the ties are just zeros. Bailey guy's getting on base. He was dominant. Okay. <laughs> well, he, to me, I, I was giving him the win. I think they gave him the save. I thought he got the win. He should have got the win. I really thought Ty was impressive. He really, these guys did not seem to have the control at that that they did against some of our other guys, whether it was playing off one pitch or another pitch, waiting for McKay to walk some more people or, or, or whatever it was against other people. Ty went right at him. And it was, it was, it was a pleasure to see those innings went quick. Right. Some of these innings were long this weekend. <laughs> Let's not, you know, pretend ties were quick. Ty got out there. He just takes care of it. And he gets the uh, pitching Joey Donato red belt for the week. So we got Bothwell, we got Tates, and we got Cole Ball for the week. I did not tally them up. I owe you guys a tally. I'll get it ready for next week. Uh, but for now, this series coming up, if anybody's going, get your pizza, 
Get your bagels. All right. You might hear New Jersey, but it's close enough. They do it right. So a preview for the Piscataway pod. We'll kick it over to Carl. Thank you, Chris. Yes. And I'm going to kind of take a, a, a slightly higher look than we typically do on these. Um, so in Piscataway, there's going to be four games, uh, two uh, right off the bat against the host uh, Rucker Scarlet Knights. Uh, the first will be at 2 p.m. on Friday. Um, there uh, are uh, no lights there, so they have to play these games early. Um, on Saturday, there's going to be an 11 a.m. game against Rutgers. Then Indiana turns around and plays Nebraska at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Um, and then will Indiana will conclude their portion on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. again against Nebraska. Um, that schedule is a little bit different than the pod that Indiana played in at the beginning of the year where they played Rutgers, then Minnesota, then Rutgers, then Minnesota. And it was, for the most part, kind of following along the week everybody did. In this pod, Indiana's going to be playing their first game against Rutgers' first game, their second game against Rutgers' second game, their third game against Nebraska's first game, their fourth game against Nebraska's second game. So they will be facing the number one and two setups for both teams. Um, and uh, that's just kind of how the way this, this works. And I think the idea is it's condensing the travel so that Indiana is out by Sunday. Nebraska doesn't have to get there until Saturday. And then Nebraska is going to keep playing until Monday. Um, but it makes it, it's an interesting challenge because Indiana is going to be facing the number one and number two for both teams. Uh, from Indiana's perspective in pitching, I don't think it's a big deal. Indiana's pretty solid and even in the pitching throughout the week. So that's not a huge issue for Indiana. Um, but it's going to be a, a little bit different for the, for the hitting and the fact that they're going to have to you know, kind of go up against these top guys. And Nebraska is not going to have their bullpen worn out um, right off the bat as, uh, as they play Nebraska. Now, you look at these two teams, uh, Nebraska and Rutgers, they just got done playing each other. Rutgers was at Nebraska, and as I mentioned before, that was a sweep. What is interesting is if you look at specifically, and I think, for example, it's important to look at the first two games because that's going to be kind of what, what pairs up with what Indiana is going to see. Um, what is interesting is that it was a battle of the bullpens that Rutgers won. Rutgers' bullpen was solid and held off Nebraska. Nebraska's bullpen cracked and the Rutgers got at Nebraska's bullpen. So it will be, that will be, I think, important to look at. Rutgers really does rely on their bullpen. Their bullpen, in fact, is the, really, from the numbers, is the better part. Um, not that they don't have good starting pitching. As Indiana learned in the very first game of the season, Harry Rutowski from the left side, he's a dangerous pitcher, but several teams have managed to get to Rutowski. Um, and I also think Indiana and coach talked about this today. Indiana has improved in how they deal with left-handed pitching. They have really, they've used the, uh, the spin machines and the VR sets to really get good reps against the movement of these left-handed pitchers. Um, so let's, let's hope that Indiana has really improved that. And so far, I mean, look at it. We've looked at three really good starters over the last few weeks. Um, that have come from the left side and Indiana has managed to do some damage. So the hope is that on Friday, you know, that that's going to happen. Um, Indiana's not sure what matchup they're going to go Saturday because there's two games, uh, you know, deciding, you know, which game is Brown going to pitch and then uh, how are they going to divvy up the other two long guys, Madunio and Bothwell, um, you know, may kind of depend on what they kind of, what they're seeing from their scouts and their matchups. And it sounds like they haven't quite, settled on what that's going to look like yet you know we're gonna we're gonna look and take a look at it uh from a hitting perspective um if i take a look at this uh we've got um Rutgers has got three guys that have ops's north of 900 um and in, and those guys also lead the team in home runs so they've got a lot of power they've got a lot of guys that are producing a lot of rbis some other guys that are really good at getting on base so they really seem to be broken into, into role players. Um, Nebraska, you look at it and it's like, wow, they're just basically, you know, no one's really dominant. They've got a bunch of guys with, with between like five and six home runs. Um, you know, they're all hitting well and for average. 
So this is just this is just one of those every every batter's a threat. So you know any any result, but I'll tell you the team that comes out of this, if one team does come out of this above the others, they're going to be in a good position uh, uh, for the rest of this run. Um, Rutgers is trying to play their way into being considered for a regional. Um, Nebraska and Indiana are battling for a Big Ten title. So now we'll put a bow on this week's show with our roundtable discussion. Uh, given what Carl just said in the preview, uh, what do we think would mark a successful weekend in New Jersey? So Cass, can you get us started tonight? Sure. Um, for me, I think I am content with two and two, especially if it's one each one. Go split with both teams, and especially if they split with each other. I I am content with two and two across the board. Uh, am I thrilled by that? No. But realistically, we've seen those three and ones are rare and sweet are exceptionally rare I am over the moon if we can go three and one and especially if two of those are Nebraska because they they are closer to us in the standings they are a team that we are full-on competing with for top of the conference so so I'm 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 good with with a Two two split, especially if it's across the board. I that that to me would be success. To to hold our own, to to just hold where we are, is the is the lower end of successful for me. And if we can do more than that, I am absolutely thrilled. I'm not going to talk so much in in terms of wins and losses. These pods are very weird, and I know we've got two of them. You know, I think the second one in some ways is more critical. It's the home one. It's, it's, it's spread out. Uh, I think we've got, uh, you know, a better advantage from the perspective of how we, we, we can utilize our bullpen over the course of four days in that second pot at the part. Um, this one's going to, going to stress the bullpen a little bit more. So if the circumstances come out that it's two and two, I will be okay. Above all else, I want to see this team really play well. Um, I want to see them get to Ratowski. That's the first yes. thing. Right on Friday, I want to see them do some damage to Ratowski. Maybe the time changes too. All these early games that they're not used to, and, and or playing over and over again with the doubleheader, it's going to feel like the non-con schedule. I think, you know, a lot of the funky schedule that they're not used to could have something to do with it. I want three. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I, I, I don't care. You know, if we're as serious about this team as we pretend we are, I know I am. I want to see them play good. Two and two is. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> two and two is sitting on the fence. It's sitting on the fence. You know, that's like not even making a pick to me. I want three. I want three and one. I feel like if this is the team that we're going to run with, that we really think can happen, three and one. Three and one or, or, or even even better. I mean, I, try to sweep the whole thing. You know, we think we're the best team. Play the best. You know, Iowa was uh, shaky, to say the least, with the errors early. But the point, the offense just came out Saturday and Sunday, and the bounce back from the poor defense early Sunday behind Gabe, the way it really just stepped up Sunday late, I thought was huge. You know, we sat here and we talked last week. What do you see about this team? And I was like, well, I want to see what we do against Iowa because I don't care what we did against Minnesota. And I think what we saw against Iowa was kind of like a microcosm of the season, like the ups and downs within a game, the ups and downs within the weekend. I don't know. I believe. I never thought we were going to score the way we did. I didn't think we would have five run innings, five run innings, three run innings. I didn't think we were going to get any of that. And I thought the pitching did a lot better than I thought it would. I, I don't see why we can't take both from Rutgers and, and, and take one of them from Nebraska. Why? Because it's the one and the two and the one and the two. Guess what? All one pitches last anyway. So it doesn't matter. Gabe's the best pitcher on his team. You know what I mean? It's just the way he happens to pitch on Sunday. And I know that. And, you know, he'll be ready for Nebraska. So I'll take three. And uh, I'll be upset when it's not four. Yeah, I mean, of course you want the sweep. Um, and like Chris said, hey, I'd be really good with three or four, to be honest. Um, but even bigger than that to me uh, is the bats need to stay hot. 
and I'm not talking about I'm I'm talking about even against the upper tier guys, not just you know the late bullpen guys. Uh, we've seen a that's big what last week the runs came early, Josh. The runs yeah. came oh yeah, early. no, that's what I'm saying. We I were putting see, up they five need to runs stay. in the second inning. I was like, what? And we that, were that's hitting those starters. Oh yeah, and that's something that I'm yeah. If we do that this weekend, even if the outcomes aren't the same, you know, I'm still I would take something good away from that, and then. Also, the errors have got to go down. Uh, they cost us a chance to see the Sunday Reds this week and complete a sweep. The one run loss with three unearned runs. Um, and we also had the three and the one on Sunday and just got away with it because we had 16 hits. But that's not good. Well, no, but, but also because the D we played late. Late, yeah. I mean, so to, still, me I mean, that's, still to me, that's a good sign. Game, though. Though. No, no, I yeah. know. I know. But the, the D we showed late at least said, you know what? I can step up and make these plays late. Even yeah. though we didn't make them early. Yeah, but you, you got to be able sign. to focus the entire game, though. True, and, true. And going off of that, I I would be very, very, very happy to not see any more two out, two strike walks by the pitching staffs. Like that, that annoyed yeah. the crap out of me on Saturday because that was what, seven two out walks and six of them were with two strikes and another two were in the fifth. And that, that if there's any runners on base and all of a sudden you're giving up two, three, two out walks an inning, that, that scared me. Cause that's, that's a control. We've had occasional little shaky points at times with control, but we hadn't, I, I, I would argue that we had not seen that level of losing control in quite a while. Um, so that that was kind of my one real red flag on the pitching staff was was those two out two strike walks. It's a great point. It's with the walks combine them with the errors. It's execution, yep. right? Yep. I mean, it's free it's bases. Do what you got to do. Yeah. Can't give out those free bases. Five <laughs> out innings, six out innings. To yep. some degree, it's execution, um, but I also think it's a tad bit more aggressive, especially when you're talking about the bottom of the order. You know, yes. Maybe it's okay to get a hit to, to give up a hit every now and then let them put the ball in play um, as opposed to, to trying to go for the swing and miss every single time. Well, yeah. We saw and, a lot of O2 or, or one, two yeah. counts that ended up full and then they fell off pitches like, and a and, lot of that this weekend. And, yeah. and I think the other thing is credit Iowa. Those guys did not swing at pitches out of the strike zone. No, no, they can hit. Oh. <laughs> yep. They did not swing at anything they, out of the strike zone. And they battled if it was close and they had two strikes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they had beginnings too, right? They, they kept coming oh, yeah. back. Yeah. That's yeah. where that tie outing really impressed me because it was the yeah. only time that mm -hmm. it really just, they weren't even getting a run in it. They just, yeah. they just, it, just it was over. Yeah. yeah. At, at no point from an offensive perspective did I feel completely comfortable with any of the game. <laughs> did not Carl matter what the lead games. was. Yeah. It did not matter yeah. what the lead was. Iowa yeah. was coming back. They were making runs. Well, what if a crumb doesn't hit the bomb? Right. Then we're sitting oh, there yeah. sweating that out too. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I was I was sitting there that last half inning with we don't don't make this exciting. Make this no. make this as boring of an inning as possible. I do not want an exciting inning at this point. For that top of the ninth. But to all credit, bouncing back every time, mm -hmm. you know. Oh yeah. And I think they could do that. Uh, it is going to the schedule is definitely going to feel weird. I really think that's an issue. I always look at stuff like that. that um, it's not your normal thing at all. Imagine what the Nebraska fans would be saying though if they were doing the one-two-one-two -one -two pitching like we are. Oh, they'd be crying. There'd be so many tweets. It would be ridiculous. But it doesn't affect. Well, they're us already going to as... cry because they're going to have to face Beerman. So, <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> Yo, Gabe was so good, man. And with the errors early, remember, I remember talking about this. Like, all right, every once in a while, there's an error on the field, and you're just going to put your head down, and you're just going to take care of it and strike the guy out. Mm. And he did it twice. Yep. And he did it twice. It was I liked, man. He was on. Just some errors. Errors happen, but you, you gotta. Oh, the errors in the walks. Take them away. We get rid of those this weekend. I think three is easily yeah. doable. Yeah. If we if we can sharpen up like that, three is absolutely four is doable if we can really tighten up. But yeah, I want to be upset that we didn't win four. That would be awesome. That, that's my thing. Yeah. I want to be upset that we didn't win four come Sunday afternoon. Go ahead into the Mother's Day festival or wherever we're going. <laughs> it, it's it's really gonna require 
to get all four, it's going to require, or even really, even to get three, we're going to need some really deep outings from our starting pitching. We got good bullpen. Don't get me wrong, but four, four games against teams of this quality is going to tax the pitching depth. Yep. Yeah. Who do you think they're going for tie? I, I, I heard what he said. It was it's Madungo or Ty for game three. I, mean, I don't I think, think it matters. I mean, I think we're going to expect yeah. four innings out of both of them. It yep. doesn't really matter which of yep. them goes first. <laughs> yeah. at, oh, so at, you think they're going to flip-flop it? You think they're both pitching the game? I, well, and again, I, well, this is well, the thing. But... It depends on how well. Um, this is the thing. Let's say, you know, let's say Friday against Ratowski. Let's say we're, you know, we managed to score two or three runs against Rutowski, three runs against Rutowski. Um, you know, Summer walks a whole bunch of guys, but manages to control it and is, is, it gets out of the fourth having given up two runs. So we're up three, two. At that point, you got to use one of your long, long guys right then on Friday. Well, they both don't have them Saturday. That they both may the whole... pitch before Sunday. Right. Right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 So that so that's that's the thing. It depends, you know, how Friday goes is going to set the table for the entire weekend. Yeah. I bet they don't even announce the last yeah. game. No, it that, sounded like he wasn't. He was talking no. TBA. Uh, that is going to be a game today. time. I would. Decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, it's just that's just like think, a regional. You put, I think you Gabe play still. I think Gabe is pitching Sunday. I think that is. Yes. Sunday. Oh, he said that. He so said the question that is yeah. how is how the whole double header on Saturday is going to go? Yeah. You know, I, I think I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, that will do it for this edition of Talking Hoosier Baseball. Read up on Indiana Baseball at iubase.com. Follow us on Twitter at See You at the Bart and at iubase17. On Instagram, iubase. And please subscribe to our Talking Hoosier Baseball channel on YouTube, where you'll find these video, video podcasts, game clips, game day media availabilities, Carl's sights and sounds at the Bart, and much more. So for Carl James, Chris Feeney, and Cassidy Palmer, I'm Josh Bennett. Hopefully soon we'll see you at the bar.